It seems anthropology is everywhere these days. And that's no coincidence, because anthropologists are everywhere these days. Anthropology is the study of us. Our clothes, our homes, our bodies, how we talk and how we think. Our past, present, and future. It's all anthropology. The American Anthropological Association has created a video series to showcase how anthropologists are tackling the world's most pressing problems and making remarkable contributions to human understanding. My name is Trisha Wong. I'm a global tech ethnographer. I'm the co-founder of Sudden Compass. The way we use technology actually is an expression of our identity. Who I am when I'm in a bar versus at work or when I'm out dancing with my friends is very different. It's the same exact thing when we're using different apps. The way I use Twitter, the way I use Snapchat or Instagram is very different or Reddit. Human dynamics is actually that we have multiple elastic identities, that we have different selves. And the way I express myself on each app is different. But when you have a bunch of engineers or product people designing an app, they're not thinking about identity, they're just thinking about a bunch of features. And that's why corporations need to bring in people like anthropologists to understand these big concepts. Anthropology gives you those skill sets. You can help companies translate their business question to a human question. This is what I call the flip. Let's just take one of my clients. You know, they were trying to get more people to buy their books. Okay, that's a great business question. But when we translate their human question, which is like, you know, how are people even learning? Why do people buy books? Where do people get information? It completely changed the way they saw their business. And that was how they succeeded. And every company needs help doing this. When I'm really doing my best kind of anthropological field work is that it's really about me. It's that I'm learning because I'm getting close to people who, at, who seem at face value so different, you know, but actually the stuff that they're going through is so common. People are all trying to figure out, you know, how do I do the right thing? How do I make people I love happy? How do I survive? How am I going to get my next meal? What do I want to be remembered for? These are all things that people are thinking about from the mundane to the complex. And you start to think, oh, okay, like we're all actually super connected, but we're also dealing with different forms of pressure in different ways. These systems that we grow up in, they're actually quite oppressive. I think they can take the life out of you if you do not have the skill sets to question it and to resist it. And then through that resistance, you find a way to live in a way that actually fulfills your values. That's why we need to have more anthropologists because we need more anthropologists resisting systems and helping us realize that these systems are based off of our choices and that we do have a choice. Yeah, my name is Diego Vigil. I am an urban anthropologist. The anthropology profession, they do a lot of stuff with people trying to help them uh, resolve problems that they have. To me, that is the main goal of social science, to study the world, to understand it, and to bring about some changes that are gonna be beneficial for individuals or large groups of people, even all of humanity. Early on, I was lucky to sort of become an observer, a watcher, a questioner, uh, a metiche, as we say in the Mexican culture. I learn from people on the street what their life is like and write about it and report about it and testify in court about it. Law enforcement, district attorneys, police like to say, that they have a new law. It's been here since 1988. It's called the Gang Injunction.
The gang injunction is not as pure an idea as they've been made to be. Now, in the case of Chapman, you know, how do we develop? How do we get land? How do we, you know, get it cheap? A geographer from USC has done a series of studies. He looked at all the gang injunctions in L.A. The gangs that were targeted were the ones that were near areas that were gentrifying. There's a way of getting rid of Mexicans. Urban renewal is an old pattern. Get rid of the Mexican neighborhoods. The Dodgers got Dodger Stadium when they got rid of Palos Verdes, you know, Chavez Ravine. So that gang injunction went to the federal courts. And I was there because I had to testify on behalf of the rural social nature of that community. How the guys could grow up together. Some are gang members, some are not, but they're still friends. In the court, it's very quiet. A couple of DAs from the Orange County area walked in. And believe me, they looked like mafiosos. Heavy, burly, mean. I'm the law, I'm the man. I got up to testify. And they got up to cross-examine, and they started trying to, you know, discredit my testimony. And the judge stopped them on more than one occasion. She shut them up, and they just sat there like little mafiosos with their thumb in their mouth. We won the case. That was the first gang injunction case that had ever been won. From that time on, those courts in Orange County are very careful. The DA is very careful about how they met out a gang injunction. And I feel proud as an anthropologist to have played a role in slowing down a draconian law. It's not enough just to understand the world. We got to change it. Being surprised by what we find is something that occurs fairly regularly. At the World Trade Center site, we were expecting to find large timber landfill retaining devices used uh, as Manhattan built out further and further into the Hudson River. One of my colleagues picked up a large curved timber and was looking at it and she thought it might be part of a ship. It didn't look anything like the other things we were finding. The excavation crew helped us remove some of the thick layers of mud from around where we thought this came from, and, it, and you very quickly saw the spines of a, of a ship. Archaeology is anthropology, or, or it isn't anything. It's the study of, uh, of the human, uh, human activity and human culture using a different suite of methodologies and skills. My name is Michael Papalardo, and I'm an archaeologist. AKRF is an environmental planning and engineering firm. My role as is, is part of the culture resource group is to look at the uh, impacts of projects on archaeological resources. As an archaeologist, I'm not looking at the in the, in the yards of important people or uh, the sites of important historic events. I'm looking more at the day-to-day -day remains of people that might not, there might not be books written about them at all. It gives us an opportunity to understand what communities were like. So there's a former bus depot. It's an entire city block in East Harlem. This site was the location of a, of a cemetery that was established in the late 1600s. And the cemetery was abandoned and destroyed, and then they rebuilt the site over time. So the city, in planning to reuse this block, they hired us to do an archaeological survey of the site. Is there a cemetery still there? Are there any human remains? What's, what's the sensitivity of it archaeologically? During the course of the work, uh, we did find human remains in one of the trenches, and that kind of changed everything. Uh, now we know that we had human remains. Uh, the human remains turned out to be disarticulated. There wasn't a, an actual burial situation where you you know, position, picture a, a body in a cemetery. The task force visited the site within the hour after finding a human skull, and it was an incredibly emotional experience for them because this task force had been kind of in existence for almost 
10 years at that point, trying to steer redevelopment of the site in a sensitive manner given its important and long history. Um, so finding it kind of made, it, made us feel part of that process. It tied us in more with the uh, important and emotional feeling that they were having, uh, you know, seeing the, the actual remains in place. Through gaining a better understanding of our past, it brings a better integration of communities today. you're at a party and you can take a step back and look at two people having an interaction, if you can tell when they're fighting, if you can tell when they're flirting, if you can tell when they've just met each other for the first time, that's anthropology. My name is Mackenzie Price and I'm a sociolinguist. A sociolinguist is a social scientist who's interested in the relationship between language and social life and social behavior. Frameworks Institute is a nonprofit communications think tank. We work with nonprofit organizations to pay attention to the language that they use when they're explaining their work and advocating for uh, the pieces of policy that they want to see in place. When they are going out and talking to people about their work, when they are testifying on the Hill, when they are making communications campaigns that try to build public support. So for example, let's say you're an advocate who wants more kids to go to pre-K because you know the years before age five happen to be a time that the human brain is developing, it's growing really, really fast. But you also know that there's a lot of other people who say kids under five aren't ready for school, they're just absorbing things. We've got a communications problem. How are we going to present pre-K, some type of educational experience that happens in that zero to five range as something that's an important support for healthy brain development, something that uh, young people or children are ready for, something that they are prepared for, that they are in fact even able to learn in this period, how do you explain all of that? Frameworks would be interested in talking to those scientists who know what's happening with the brain between zero to five and figuring out how to talk about brain development in a way that more people can engage with. And we also work with that advocate who wants to talk about pre-K who wants to talk about why it matters for brain development, but needs some strategies for explaining brain development to somebody at the post office or at a town hall meeting. We can shift away from kids just absorb things to there's a lot of brain development happening between zero and five. Really, you can do anything you want to do and be a linguist. Every field has a piece of it somewhere that's, that's interested in social relationships and society and thinking about language, how people interact with one another is a part of that and that's a skill that you can take with you different places. Yeah, anthropology, just like linguistics, can take you anywhere you want to go. Death doesn't happen nine to five, Monday through Friday. It happens all the time. A lot of the times, up the phone will ring and I'm dead asleep. They'll tell me, you know, it's a 35 year old with a single gunshot wound to the head and there's a note on the scene. So it's probably a suicide. I'm a death investigator and a forensic anthropologist. Forensics is anything um, relating the law and science together. So when we apply the law to anthropology, that basically means we're using our knowledge of human osteology and kind of applying that to the law. 
The purpose of a medical examiner's office is to determine cause and manner of death. It's my job when I go out to the scene and when I'm asking questions on the phone of family members, doctors, uh, law enforcement is basically to rule out everything else and I do that with the specific questions that I ask. And this is where kind of the anthropology training comes into play. So I'm going to ask cops specific questions and look for specific answers. Whereas with the families, they just lost a loved one, you know? So you have to kind of, you have to change your tone. You have to change the language that you're using um, when you're speaking to them. I've always wanted to do more of the forensic science side than uh, be a professor of anthropology or work kind of in a traditional anthropology role. I was a researcher for the World War II Directorate, and the, we went back and recreated the last known whereabouts and the circumstances of the loss of folks from World War II service personnel. One of the very first Battle of the Bulge fights, they took some shots from the German soldiers, the boat went down, they couldn't positively identify this gentleman. Uh, his name is Private Bain. So they buried him as an unknown, and there he stayed for 60 years. Being trained in forensic anthropology, I went back in his records and was able to kind of recreate everything, and they had made a mistake. His dental report said that he was missing one of his molars, but the original, when he first entered the army, they had said that he was missing a different molar. Doing that identification with Bain was kind of just a touch and a taste of using what I know to provide closure to a family, and, and I, I knew that's what I wanted to do. The good thing about an anthropology degree, it provides you with kind of this broad overview of human beings. People are scared of death. In the United States, we are so reverent. A lot of the times we ignore it. And that's a very American thing to do, right? Let's just ignore it and it'll go away. But everyone dies, and I think it's important to find out why and what happened. It's respectful to the person and to their family so they know. I do this job because it's the worst day of people's lives and I can do it. Somebody has to help these families and figure out why their loved one is deceased. I'm glad to do it and it encompasses all the things that I love to do.